Alright, we're in Matthew. I'm going to start in chapter 11. And the title of the study series is This is Jesus, the King of the Jews, which is what Pilate announced. And we're going to take that as our uh, title. I need you to go in to page 3 in your notes there and this description of the study before we get right into the scriptures themselves. This is part 2 of an extensive examination of the Gospel according to Matthew. And it has the distinction of being first in the fourfold gospel of the New Testament. You ever wonder why Matthew's first and not Luke or Mark? It's because it is, it is um, uh, the fundamental. It has all of the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We like, I, my preferred uh, gospel is Luke. I just like Luke. It's the most complete gospel. It has everything start to finish. It's laid out logically. But God didn't write it that way. Matthew's the first one. Luke's going to be uh, written much later. Matthew is written to, to show the connection with all of the Old Testament. So this course is going to explore the content of the book of Matthew and its portrayal of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Obvious subjects. But last semester we looked at introductory matters, such as the theories of the book's setting, its author, its sources, structure, and purpose. We believe it is written by Matthew. We believe it was... It is right where it should be. We don't correct the Bible. Now when you compare Matthew to the other Gospels, it will highlight both what Matthew has in common with the other early Christian portrayals of Jesus, as well as his unique perspective. In the study, and that's a unique thing, I mean, uh, uh, Luke was a doctor, so his perspective's kind of precision as far as detail. Matthew's precision as a... As a um, uh, Tax collector, his details were everything has to add up with the Old Testament. It really is amazing. So C, the study of certain specific passages will, going to be, uh, will become the occasion to discuss modern scholarly methods and approaches to the study and interpretation of Matthew. Which means, when we, when we deal with the larger themes and issues related to the book, like Christological titles, discipleship, ecclesi ecclesiology, which is the study of the church, the kingdom of God, the role of women, uh, the conflict with Jewish authorities, the fulfillment of the Mosaic law, um, invective uh, uh, against the Pharisees, meaning uh, aggression against the Pharisees, view of history, role of miracles, last judgment, uh, the use of the Old Testament, and super cessationism. I never can be able to say that. Secessionism, meaning the end of all things. So, um, in, in, in each one of these things, when you come to Matthew, you're dealing with a lot of different subjects. We're going to try to touch on them. Now our objectives are, my goal is that when you finish this, you'll have a thorough knowledge of the content of this book. You'll have some familiarity with different theories regarding the setting, the composition, the structure, and the purpose of the gospel. And awareness also, uh, I want you to have an awareness of different approaches to study and interpreting the book of, of Matthew. You can look at it historically. Uh, you can look at it um, uh, at the, the, the criticism, how people... Uh, question its sources, form criticism, atheistic criticism. You ought to be able to defend it all. Uh, number D, familiarity with key themes of the book, uh, as well as, uh, and with Matthew's views on matters such as Christology, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. As I said, discipleship, understanding of history, use of the Old Testament. It's just amazing when, when Matthew refers to that it might be fulfilled. Come on in. That it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled. Uh, to fulfill the scripture. Um, the um, uh, his uh, Matthew, unlike the rest of the of the gospel writers, Matthew has a, a definite burden to make sure that we connect the dots. So um, you'll you'll see the connection uh, with the Old Testament. You'll see the significance of the Jewish law, and you'll see how Jesus conflicted with the Jewish leaders. Uh, if you want to grab Matthew there. And uh, we're on page three. I'm going through the course objectives. And um, number E, uh, the objective is to make you aware of how the book of Matthew is both similar and different from other Christ Christian portrayals of Jesus, uh, like Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and give you some understanding of the interpretation of Matthew in the history of Christian thought and appreciation for what book can contribute to Christian faith. So, uh, all that to say this, when you come to the book of Matthew, you can get in trouble if you base all of your Christianity just on this one book. Because Matthew is not a complete composite um, description of the Christian life, of the Christian faith, and uh, it does not explain all of the Old Testament. It just shows the life of Christ as he fulfilled the law. 
which is the most important thing that we can thank God for, because if it weren't for somebody in our place perfectly fulfilling the Old Testament law, everything's doomed. So Matthew's main emphasis is not to wrap everything up. What one book can you guess? And we're going to have a lot of interaction. But what one book wraps everything up and ties all the loose ends together in the Bible? Revelation. Exactly. So Revelation is kind of like the laces on a shoe. All of the Old Testament, even all of the New Testament, have unfinished statements, have um, incomplete um, concepts. And so Revelation ties it all together. So um, uh, it just puts it in perspective because there are Christian groups who really are very restrictive in where they read. Um, and they'll just read the, um, uh, the Beatitudes, and they'll just follow um, uh, Christ's teachings in Matthew. They won't look at Luke, they won't look at Paul's teachings. And would you agree that that would be very dangerous? Mm -hmm. And it would be just as dangerous as an Old Testament Jew believing only uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and never allowing any of the prophets, nothing else like that. So... Course objectives get you to where you understand the place of Matthew, its purpose, and its limits. Not that it's limited, but it, it doesn't have all everything. That's why the rest of the Bible is written. Your required textbook is a King James Bible. Uh, you can bring any Bible you want, but if you don't have a King James Bible, you're going to miss a lot of things that I'm going to try to teach you because I'll be pointing out errors with the new Bibles. Here's your requirements. This is what I need you to do. A. You've got to read the book of Matthew two times before completing this course. Now that sounds simple, but sometimes it's hard to fit that into your schedule. Well, that just means 28 chapters, not just 11 to 20 because that's what the course covers, but 28 chapters I need you to read through twice over the next 13 weeks because that's one of your questions on your final. I need you to do a four-page research study on the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now some people believe there's no difference. Good. Prove it. Some people believe there is a difference. Good. Prove it. I want you to see, is there a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Um, number C. Now, if you are just starting this, uh, this time with Matthew, you didn't do module one, then I need you to look, uh, I need you to notice as you're reading through Matthew, I need you to summarize each chapter. What that means is this. You'll come to chapter 1, and on a piece of paper, I want you to talk about a summary of the chapters of Matthew. Okay, you can just call it that, that's fine. Also, let me say this, when you, when you, when you do a paper, when you do any report, I want your name, I want to know a date, and I want to know the course, and this is the Gospel of Matthew, Module 2. So I need that up there, and then you'll tell me what this, what you're doing here now. So you'll deal with chapter 1. So you just say CH1. I want a brief, and I mean five words, seven words. I don't want a sentence, or a very long sentence. I want a brief summary of what did chapter 1 talk about. What did chapter 2, all the way down to chapter 28. So, I can give you an example. Guess what chapter 28 was about. Great Commission. Well, okay. You, that's fine. So you just want to say Great Commission. All right. Promises of God. Well, this, the whole Bible is the promises of God. <laughs> but I want you to summarize a chapter because chapter 28 is the resurrection. Hmm. Now, don't get too detailed where you're saying it's the resurrection and the empowerment of the disciples and the Great Commission. Just find something. The reason why I do this is you need to be able... If I said chapter 15, I want to know something that's in chapter 15. If I said chapter 21, or if I said this, what chapter did Jesus lay into the Pharisees and tear them apart and says, hypocrites, and he went after them? What chapter was that? And you ought to be like, oh, I know what chapter. Because you have summarized mm -hmm. all 28 chapters. Simply. Okay? So that is a... That is a um, yeah. Uh, a, a document, it's going to be two pages probably um, that you've got to have by the end of the uh, semester. Number D, a completion, you'll have an exam at the end of the course. Number E, class attendance, I need you to participate. It's imperative that students commit to attending the entire semester of class. 
you can audit or you can take the class for for um, uh, for actual scoring and for actual um, uh, grading. Now there are certain emergencies I'll always uh, recognize. You can always watch online, but uh, you're graded based upon your participation in the class discussions. Now all of your your course materials on the right hand uh, far right. Uh, Romeo, is this this is the schedule? Every one of the dates, and usually what what uh, um, subjects we will be covering are there. So, like today, we're starting September twelfth. We'll be dealing with chapter eleven, and then September eighteenth. Also, Romeo, let me tell you, next week for Wednesday. Now, I'll try and remember to text you. But instead of Thursday, I have to be away Thursday. So we'll, instead of going to Bible study. We're going to be here doing discipleship, uh, be uh, doing the Bible Institute. Yeah. So, but each date is right there, so you know most every Thursday except for two. The other one to notice is circle number eight there, October 30th, which will also be a Wednesday because Thursday is October 31st. And um, uh, we'll be having a light the night activity for church, and so Wednesday we'll be having this here. So all of your... Um, uh, materials, all your course materials are due into me, guess what date? According to that schedule, what date? 12th of December. The 12th of December. So you got to the 12th of December when we have our final and everything needs to be turned in by then. Um, so let's do, let's go to chapter 11. And we're going to start and you'll be filling in the blanks. There's a lot to fill in and you're, you're welcome to talk. I, I might ask at some point, if we talk too much, I might say, hey, talk to me afterwards or whatever, just so that we can try to get through as much material as possible. Also, you'll find yourself, you know, already having an idea about something or whatever, and we may disagree, we may differ, that's fine. Just stay with, stay with me and you may see what I'm showing, and I would be glad to uh, uh, learn what you've learned. But right now I'm teaching, so... Um, uh, just give us some, some, some room to be able to learn both together and uh, take this thing verse by verse, which is the best way to learn our Bible. All right, so uh, by way of introduction there, on here comes, uh, now I've titled, notice what I did here. What did I title chapter 11? Look at the top of the page. Explaining John the Baptist. So Jesus spends a lot of time talking about John the Baptist. So this helps. So if I want to know what's the chapter about John, not about his preaching, but about his character and about his humanity and his struggles is chapter 11. So, number A, uh, we're not quite in the middle of Christ's three and a half year ministry. At this point, it is still probably around the first year as you're fill in there. You're still in, by the time you get to chapter 11, you're still probably somewhere around the first or the beginning of the second year of Christ's ministry. So your fill in there is first, and he will... He is still heavily involved in two things, teaching and miracles. The last year of Christ's ministry, he will focus almost exclusively only on teaching. That's your fill-in, teaching. His miracles, his miracles will be fewer and fewer as he gets closest to his crucifixion. So, uh, tell me if you don't notice this in your Bible, as you're reading Matthew, over time and you do chapter 3... Four, five, six, seven, da, 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 28. Okay, so you'll find when Jesus starts here, he has, in chapter 4, he has no miracles. He goes out and, and he, he is tempted by the devil, which is a miracle, and he starts, and his miracles are pretty intensive until around chapter 13, and by the time you get to 28, there are no miracles of Christ except his resurrection, okay? So you'll see a period of time where it's pretty heavy and then it drops off somewhere around, um, let's see, I'm going to say around 15, 16, somewhere around there, it begins to really drop off. So in chapter 10, Jesus has empowered his 12 disciples. And he made them into apostles. Did you ever notice that? Go back to chapter 10 and verse 1. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. And when he, Jesus, had called on him his twelve, and circle that word in your Bible, he called his twelve disciples. Now, how many disciples did he have overall? Twelve. No. Seventy or odd. Well, he had twelve, and he had seventy, and he had thousands of them. He has not, this, he hasn't experienced John chapter 6 yet. He hasn't, he hasn't watched them all walk away. They are coming in, and they are disciples. Now, they mainly want free food. 
but he calls 12 of his disciples and he gave them, number one, power against unclean spirits. Um, and um, let's see here. I forgot this. He gave them power against unclean spirits uh, to cast them out and to heal all manner of diseases and all, ma uh, all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then he lists the names of them, and notice what he says. Now the names of the twelve, what does he change their title to? Twelve apostles now. So something happened between their, their following to now their empowerment. So at first they start off as, as a disciple. What does a disciple mean, uh, Clive? Just a follower of Christ. Okay, so how many people should be followers? Everybody. Okay, good. Now followers means... Uh, they, they, they follow, they do as he did, do as he did, did he believe do? what he did, <laughs> you know, I just, I just believe what Jesus believed, that's my whole point, uh, what did you say, Clive? I'm sorry? No, I was just questioning what you said. I, 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 I clarified it. I was not saying that we should raise the dead or things like that at that point at all times, but, so, do as he did, um, and, uh, and um, so anyway, that's a disciple. Believe it. We just want to be like Jesus. Now, it moves from disciple to apostle. And an apostle is something much different. Uh, number two, an apostle is a man who is empowered and sent out. So a disciple is told to follow me. Fo follow Jesus, all right? You're, you're coming to him and you're following him. An apostle has been empowered and sent out for a specific purpose. There were only 12 apostles. So people who are sent out today are not apostles, but they are evangelists, those are church starters, and pastors. But there are no apostles today. So if you hear of somebody calling themselves an apostle, just laugh and just go, they never read their Bible. They just want to have the attention. Yes, sir? So what's the uh, meaning of apostle and the disciples? Okay, what? disciple means follower. Apostle means sent one. So if, if I want, if, if I have uh, somebody, I invite them to church, I'm inviting them to follow Jesus. But there are people whom Jesus touches their heart and says, I want you to serve me and go for me now. I want you to go and start a church. I want you to go and, and, and give the gospel to those people or whatever. That's a sent one. That's what an apostle is. But these apostles weren't just sent. They had powers, didn't they? They were about able to do crazy things. Now, D's got a very long list. I'm just going to mention some of them. Number one, uh, these were the things that Jesus commanded his disciples. Uh, in chapter 11, we'll start in chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now, what did he command them? To minister to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. That's your first fill-in. So Christ's first Israel, is it? Israel, yes. Christ's first calling was to his dis, to his own people. In John chapter one, it says he came into his own, and his own received him not. Matthew one twenty one, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people, his people, from their sins. The second thing he told his disciples to do was to preach. Chapter seven ten seven chapter ten verse seven says, preach. And it was because the, the, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. That's your fill-in. At hand. At hand. Means it was within reach. Uh, these papers are at hand. And it was just right there, the kingdom of heaven. Number three. You mean the, the God's word? Or? God's kingdom was right there. If, if they had accepted Jesus <coughs> as their Messiah, the kingdom would have come. But they rejected Jesus. They rejected the kingdom as God wanted to have. And so the kingdom of God, the, the kingdom of heaven, was put aside and is delayed until the... Uh, and we have the kingdom of God. But one of these days the kingdom of heaven is going to come back in in full force and the king will be here. So they were going to preach and say, and listen, just like I preach now, listen, one of these days everything's going to be wrapped up, man. It is right at hand. Number three, to restore... I mean, what a wasted effort Christianity is if it didn't help people. Restoring the, the destructive work of the devil. John 10.10 10, 
Uh, go back to John 10, 8. It says this, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Wow! What was he doing? Undoing what the devil had done. So, um, uh, the, his, he sent his disciples out to restore what the devil had broken. Number four, he taught them to pray. And praying is a priority ministry. I don't think I... I always am convicted about how little I pray and how much I need to pray. There's just... We're so busy... And we're trying to do so many things. So many of them are good things. But he sent his disciples, he said, and when you go, pray. And watch and pray. He was constantly trying to get them to make sure you pray. Number five, I want you to minister, not just in the temple. Wouldn't it be easy to minister to people who already were in the temple, who were the choir, who were... Or, no, he wanted them to go out to the highways and hedges. He wanted them to go to places where people were not looking for God. To, um, uh, they went from house to house. Look at chapter 10, verse 11. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, whatever city, inquire in it who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go thence. So go from house to house, look for people who are looking for God. Number six, minister all for free. Number seven, minister all by faith. Number eight, here's your fill in be harmless. Be harmless. Number 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So even though the apostles had great power, they were not supposed to call down fire from heaven and burn up their enemies. So he says, I want you to be as harmless as a dove. Number 9, I want you to beware of men. That's why he said, Endure to the end. Um, uh, stay the course. Don't let anybody discourage you. Uh, Clive, do you remember... Uh, an event in the Old Testament where a prophet was sent to go and preach against a king. And God said to him, when you go, don't go to the right hand, or go to the left, don't stop, don't talk to anybody. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. And on his way back, there was an old right. prophet who was backslidden, who was not right with God, and he says, yeah, but the Lord told me that you need to come home with me. Mm. And what happened to that young prophet? He got at by a lion. He got at by a lion. You got to be careful of the influence of men, because they may have. I mean, that older uh, prophet may—he hadn't talked to God in years, but he thought he was. Man, just come home. Why don't you talk to me? Why don't we have fellowship? And he caused him to disobey God. What a thing! So beware of men, because not everybody who claims to be a prophet is right with God. So you got to endure. You got to stay the course. Number ten: Be on the move. Keep moving. So Go into every city. Be Sorry. What was the blank? To be out of. Number nine is to beware of men, and then the second one is endure to the end. Endure to the end. Endure yes. to the end. I'm racing because these are all a review from last time. Oh, yeah. But 1022 is, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So beware of men, how they affect you. Endure. Endure. Number ten, be on the move. Always go, go, keep going from city to city to house to house. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And when you've gone, somebody else will come up behind you and they'll do it again. Just keep going. Christianity should never, ever slow down. should never stop. Number 11, beware of fear. Verse 24, he says, The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant be like his Lord, be as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, demon possessed, how much more should they call them of his own household? <clears throat> Fear them not therefore when they call you names, when they single you out, when they mock you, and when they, they malign you and, and say you're everything wrong. Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered right now that shall not be revealed one day and, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness... Go ahead and speak it in the light. What you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the house of. So don't be afraid. Don't even fear death. It goes on in verse 28. Don't fear them that have the power over your body. Fear him who has power over your soul. So don't fear death. And then don't fear your struggles. Chapter 10 was very full on what Jesus expected of his people, especially his apostles. And number 12, be a blessing. Be a blessing to the world. Verse 40 says... He that receiveth you is actually receiving me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. 
He that receiveth a prophet, just in the name of a prophet, shall receive a prophet's reward. He that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Meaning that you try to be a blessing to a, to a prophet. God honors you for honoring a prophet, honoring a righteous man. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of one of my disciples, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Because you're being a blessing, God will bless you. All right, now Jesus is going to turn his attention and teach the crowds. And the, and the, and the number of his disciples are going to explode in numbers. So let's start in chapter 11. And I want to start in verse 1. It says 2, but 1 to 6, and it says this. came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again these things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So Jesus is kind of um, uh, uh, the focal point of blame for John. John's upset, and we're going to find out why in just a moment. And the whole point, the whole focus is, Jesus, what's wrong? And watch what, what, uh, what we learn here. Number one. John the Baptist is where? Where is John at this point? Prison. He is in prison. So that's your fill-in. John is in prison. And this was, this was so amazing. His was the most successful ministry of all the prophets in all of history. Can, can, can you announce, I mean, there was only one other guy I could say that was more successful numbers-wise, and who would that have been? Elijah. Mm, no, I don't think Elijah had... That depth of uh, following, of reaction, and the numbers Moses. were Moses. there, but they were very superficial. Was it Moses? Number one. Well, um, I hadn't thought of that. I would say Moses. Well, I th I don't think they followed Moses yeah. as much as they escaped Pharaoh. <laughs> now the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, Moses is leading them out, but just a few days earlier, they were really struggling with whether to believe or not. Who's the one person who had an incredible number of people converted? Paul. Mm -mm. Well, I'm, uh, I mean, I, I, I can understand, yeah. How about a guy named Jonah? Jonah. Oh, yeah. All right. Under the fish boat. Yes, yeah. and he sense. preached in Nineveh, and the entire yeah. city yeah, the king also repented, did. okay? Yeah. So Jonah's an illustration of, of great success in numbers, but, man, was um, when, when Jesus wanted to uh, point out the greatest prophet of all. Guess which one he points to? John. So, John's got the most successful. When he, he didn't even go and invite anybody. He just sat out in a valley and he preached as loud as he could. And people, passing by, says, we got to go hear this guy. And then people came and then people came. And it was like nothing ever before or ever after. John was a success story. Only Jonah saw more people repent. But John experienced the greatest success among the Jews. Yet he was publicly against sin in politics. Uh, so, hence, Herod's wife hated him, and it got him in trouble and put him in prison. Number two, so can we mix politics and religion? No. Technically, no, but you can definitely rebuke politicians, and you can definitely, you definitely don't keep your mouth shut about the abuse of power. Number two, John is discouraged. John is discouraged as you fill in. He is full of doubts. It's kind of strange. For the first six months, uh, he was the six months older cousin of Jesus Christ. Both were miracle babies, if you remember their their uh, their mother's pregnancies. Yeah, John the Baptist. Hmm? John also. John the Baptist. Remember well, his John mother. Baptist, yeah, John the Baptist's mother was an old woman. She had never had children. All of a sudden, she's pregnant. Now, not it's not virgin birth, but it was still a miracle birth. <clears throat> So the Holy Spirit had revealed to, um, uh, to John who Jesus was. Um, he had heard of all that Jesus did up in Galilee. John mainly ministered in Judea at the Jordan River. 
Jesus had ministered up in Galilee. But as it was with John the Baptist, when you're sitting alone in prison, it's hard to be encouraged and you need encouragement. I would. If, if Clive, if I was in prison and nobody ever came to visit me, I might doubt if you're even saved. How can you not come and visit me? <laughs> That's how he felt about Jesus. Um, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Number E, success. I mean, John preached and people came. They got converted it, from their old um, uh, dead Jewish um, uh, rituals and they were looking for the Messiah. But that success never fixed his heart. Only the stability of Jesus Christ, knowing that he is who he claims to be and he always will be, can put your heart to rest. The fact that Jesus is at work, working out a perfect plan, and that you're part of it, that fixes and calms your heart. So John has his own disciples. Did you notice it says there, verse 2, Now when John had heard, that, uh, now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. So, um, Jesus, uh, Jesus has, let's list them, we know that he has 12 disciples. But not just that, he has 70 and he has thousands who follow him everywhere. It's, it's like a mob. John, we don't know how many he has. But we know he has at least two. <laughs> two who, who just listen to him and learn from him. And that's a good mark, you know. Uh, we kind of imagine that John the Baptist was just always alone in the wilderness. But there were two men who, whatever they had been doing, whatever uh, jobs, whatever businesses, whatever families or whatever, they came and they followed John. They loved to learn from John. And the mark of a, of a mature Christian is you're pouring your life into someone else. Somebody looks up to you. Somebody's a, a son in the faith. To you. John's got two of his own disciples. He sends, sends two of them to ask a burning question. B, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another? Now that explains a lot. There were lots of different people who were very offended at Jesus. Number A, Jesus was not what they expected. In Matthew 13, you find the common people, common, C-O-M-M-O-N, people were put off by what Jesus did and said sometimes. So, um, uh, people sometimes would be shocked and go, what? How can this be? Go to Matthew 13 and look at it. 13.54 and, and when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished. That doesn't mean in a good way. And they said, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Where did he get all this wisdom? How did he learn to do all these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Watch verse 57. And they were what? Offended. Isn't that a good modern term? Everybody is today offended. And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save or except in his own country and in his own house. So, uh, the common people were put off by Jesus. Says, Wait a minute, Jesus, you just, that's a little too much. You're going too fast, too far. Number two, in Matthew 15, the Pharisees were constantly upset and offended at what Jesus said and did. So number two, you're filling as Pharisees. Now you'll find in, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 27, Jesus made it very clear. He says, do not offend the Romans. Do not offend. Go to 17, 27. 17, 27. And this is when they were supposed to pay a tax. And the verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, the Gentiles. Go thou to the sea, cast a hook, take up a fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Take and given to them for me and thee. Why do you think Jesus was concerned about not upsetting the Romans? I would have thought, hey, ignore the Romans. Forget about what they think about you. Why do you think? So they could have a peaceful life and then carry about their own business? You know, it, it's, that's As number two on my list. But that's, that's probably most forgotten is, you know, 
there are times when you do have to rebuke. There are times you do have to stand up. But there are some times you say, listen, I'll just pay the tax. Yeah. I just because also it wasn't. It, I mean, number one is it wasn't offending God's any of God's laws. Nope. So if it doesn't directly affect any of God's laws, you just let them do what they want to do. And exactly. And but he's not trying to raise a riotous uh, army against the Romans. Yeah. Or you don't want to cause rebellion. Yes. Yeah. And so because at at any moment he could have said, "Let's fight." And people were like, yeah, there was that type of attitude. In that day, they hated the Romans. And he says, let's not upset the Romans. It's like, what? You know, we want to upset the Romans. So uh, he was careful not to offend them. Number four, in Matthew 26, 31, every one of Jesus' disciples openly got offended at Jesus, didn't they? Yep. And they all walked and ran away from him. So <laughs> even, even John got upset. So have you ever been upset? at Christianity in general. Be honest. Have you ever looked at your Christian life, looked at what you see God expecting of you, what you look at all the failures, do you ever just go, this is stupid, I can't handle it? Ever done that? Yes? No? Honestly. No, not really. I know where you're coming from. I get more upset about everyone else. <laughs> okay. And, right. you know, I know I can't do it. I just accept the fact Good. that I can't do it. All right. Maturity but, does bring you to the place where you... You, you, but I, you I look at everyone else going, there's nobody else even trying or even thinking about this. Exactly, yeah, you get offended at, at the lack of, when we Jesus say offend. Doesn't. But offend means cause to trip, cause to stumble. And sometimes the pressure that God allows on your life or even puts on your life can make you, like Job, desire, I just wish I could die. I just, I just wish I could quit. And that's being offended. And John is in prison and he's offended at Jesus. He says, Jesus, I've, I've, I've lost all my trust in you. I, I don't even know who you are. That's low. So, now did he lose his salvation? No. Thank God. See, I've, I've had debates. I've had too many debates where somebody says, oh, you can lose your salvation. Then John should have lost his salvation. Because he didn't even believe Jesus was the Messiah at that point. He was so low. But I think he was, sorry for interjecting here, but I think he was more confused because he knew the Old Testament scriptures. Sure. He was, he was the prophet sent from God to make way the Lord, make his path straight. And he was saying, the kingdom's just at hand here, and I'm sitting in prison. Is this the right guy? You know, you can just imagine his despair, and that's what caused him to doubt his faith. Mm -hmm. And he said, will you go over to that Jesus lad and ask him, is he the man we're supposed to be looking for? Or should we wait for, look for another? Because I'm, I'm so confused here. Yep. What's going on? The confusion is real. Yeah. And, and you'll get, if there's anything, the author of confusion, will make it so that you go, things aren't adding up. I should be with Jesus. I should still be down there in Jordan. Yeah. Why am I here? So there's confusion, there's emotions all wrapped up where he just says, I, I, I don't understand. So, number B, even with John the Baptist, Jesus was doing the unexpected. That's your fill-in, unexpected. Jesus did not come and visit him. If John was Jesus' older cousin, his family, Shouldn't he have expected Jesus to come and at least comfort him? <clears throat> shouldn't he be, shouldn't Jesus have at least sent, I'm praying for you, <laughs> something? And there was no word. So Jesus was doing unexpected things. He did not get John released from prison. I mean, certainly Jesus could have done, said something to somebody, my goodness. But rather, Jesus focused his attention mainly up in the hillbillies, up in Galilee, leaving John alone in prison down in Jerusalem. Number C, Jesus was on a one-track course. He came and did a lot of healing, but not everyone was healed. Think about that. Not everyone was freed. His purpose was, here's your fill-in, to go to the cross. To go to the cross. End of story. So why is it that when I pray, Lord, I pray for so-and-so's health, and I do, and I pray for so-and-so for you to bless their life, give them a job. I pray for somebody, so-and-so to find a, a, a wife, so-and-so to find a husband. Why is it that that doesn't happen very often? Because God's main desire in this age is, God, please, give me courage. This is what I should be praying, so that I can win somebody to Christ. Because your whole purpose, your whole desire is to answer the cry for salvation. So, he came... His whole purpose of coming was to go to the cross, not to become the king. Now Jesus responded to John's disciples that his works 
prove who he is. That's your fill in there on his the works. works. His works. His works. What he did. Words are cheap. Jesus could say, hey, I'm the Messiah. You know, it's really crazy. I deal with a Muslim here, I deal with a Muslim there, and they say, Jesus never claimed to be God. You go, you know, he did, but there's no use showing you because you won't believe it. But his works prove that he was God. End of story. But Muhammad was not resurrected. Say again? Uh, Prophet Muhammad was not resurrected. No, he was not. Not like Jesus. <laughs> no. So, uh, we have the list that Jesus says, come and watch. And he says, they saw the blind receive their sight. They saw the lame walking. They saw the, the lepers that were cleansed. The deaf were hearing. The dead were raised up, which is pretty good. The poor had the gospel preached unto them. These are all the fulfillment of Isaiah 35. If you go, we won't go there, but Isaiah 35 lists all the things that Jesus did. That was to reassure John to say, look, this yes. is one of and remind him, and remind him, you know these scriptures. And when you go back, tell him everything that was prophesied, <sighs> he, Jesus is doing. Yeah. Number five, Jesus adds that there's a special blessing on those who do not get offended at how life turns out. Wouldn't that be? Listen, uh, both of you have boys, and I have... Uh, two boys and three girls. And one of the most important things for me to pass on to my children is this. When a lot, it's not God's... It's, it's not God's... Uh, don't expect God to make your life the best life ever. Mm -hmm. uh, how your life turns out is up to Him and you're supposed to just stay the course. Married or unmarried, you stay the course. Um, uh, in the ministry, you stay the course. Out of the ministry, just serve God no matter what way. Stay the course. So, uh, don't get offended at how life turns out. Um, I'm hearing too many people getting cancer. Too many people getting sick and just not recovering. I don't know how to answer it other than stay the course. Keep the faith. God will always make up for it. Stay in just the course endure for of, Him. You mean stay in the course of Jesus' uh, ministry? Uh, gospel words, uh, or follow Stay. the Bible words. Like. Yeah, follow the Bible. Uh, follow what you know is right to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Stay. Well, I think no matter uh, the way I look at it, myself personally is, no matter how bad things get, God loves me, and I'm going to be with Him someday. Mm -hmm. and that's that's the peace yeah. that I He'll make I it up to you. Through. And right now, I might know everything, but you know, I know God is there, and I know I'm saved. Amen. That's that's all I need to know. Yes. If I knew nothing else, I know at least I know that. But you and I are sitting right now. We got cars. We got money, we got a job, we got health. But if you were in prison or if you were in, in a car accident and you were in a, an attraction in a hospital, you're going to be that way for the next six months, that'll work on you. Boy, it'll break you. If the devil could break us and if God allowed it, man. But you know, if we could remember, if we could, no matter what, if we were sitting in traction and all we could do, all we could move was our eyelid. Mm -hmm. Just remember, just just sit there and go, right, God, I'm in this position. What can I do? What? Why am I here? What, Amen. What? what there's obviously a reason that this happens. You know, God just doesn't go around maiming people for, no. for the fun of it, like. No. You know, so there's obviously a reason. In, Joe, in, in John, there's a lot to learn from John. We can't, we can't even touch the hem of the garment. But God allowed that, just like He allowed and, and encouraged the devil, says, take, take him on. Uh, bring Job down. I want to show the world what, what, what a man can put up with because of his faith in me. And John, you're struggling with your faith. But let me encourage it and get you to go all the way. Because John ultimately does give his life, doesn't he? Yeah. Loses his head. He stays the course. He just had a, a, a valley there. All right, number B. Now Jesus begins to teach about John the Baptist. People have watched John, and I'm sure a lot of people have thought, you know, they knew John. But Jesus is going to teach about John the Baptist there, Look, starting in verse 7 in uh, chapter 11. Matthew 11, verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, much and more than a prophet. For this is he... Of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven 
is greater than John is now. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, made music, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you. We've wept and cried, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified. Of her children. Now, there's a lot to cover. But hundreds of thousands of people, thinking about it, <clears throat> went out to the wilderness and what did they see? Did they see a nice gentle breeze blowing a weed or a branch? Did they see a man clothed in soft uh, clothes like a televangelist? Out in the wilderness, soft, nice clothes are for those living in king's palaces. What did you see out there in the wilderness? And Isaiah 40 talks about it. A. They saw a prophet. That's your fill in there with A. And at that point, when John the Baptist begins to preach, it's been 400 years since the last prophet, Malachi, had preached. So this was unusual. Number B, more than a prophet. They saw someone more than a prophet. And it's Jesus, Pastor. No. When they went out to the wilderness and they heard John preaching, oh. they saw John was a prophet. Yeah. But they found that Jesus said he was more than a prophet. Well, Jesus said John that Jesus he was... said John was more than a prophet. Okay, obviously Jesus is the Son of God, so he's more. But it's about this guy named John. Because if you looked at John, you know what you would have known? Yeah. You would have seen, or you would have seen, you would have seen a guy wearing camel hair. Yeah. You would have seen him crunching on fried or roasted um, uh, locusts dipped in honey. Yeah. You would have seen a guy with matted long Nazarite hair, you would have smelled him from half a mile away because of his body odor. And Jesus says he's the greatest man ever born. I always think, I always think of Captain Caveman when I think of <laughs> That's very good. Captain Caveman. <laughs> one more smart question, Pastor. Sorry? What's the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of I can't God? answer you yet because I want you to learn. Okay. We will go through and I'll show you times where Jesus says... Heaven and the kingdom of God. The difference between... you you got to understand... You have, you have a, uh, I, I want you to think it through. Uh, seek ye first the kingdom of what? Kingdom of God. All right. So I'm going to go kingdom of God. So seek, now when he says that, seek the kingdom. Wow. When the, if the kingdom of God was physical. 633 Matthew. 633 Matthew. Six, if the kingdom of God was physical, where do you find it? Where do you go to, that it's called the kingdom? Jesus is the kingdom of God. Hmm. And then later on, he says the, and I'm just going for time, kingdom of heaven. And then he says, is that, that, that. And you're going to look and say, that seems to be different. So I want you to find out what are the differences. If you think there are differences, some people don't believe there are, but I'm hinting that you're going to find some differences. Number C. All right, let me tell B. So more than a prophet. This is the herald understand what a herald is? He's the announcer of Jesus, the Messiah. So number C. And we're told, Jesus says, He that there's to hear, believe me, John is Elias or Elijah. Go ahead and put Elijah there in John practice. Was? John was Elijah. Oh, John was Elijah. Yes. John was Elijah. He was taken straight away to the heaven. Well, Elijah did. He was raptured, wasn't he? He took straight off. He did not die. They didn't die. Now, he had the spirit of Elijah, Jesus says, but God, knowing that Israel would reject Jesus, did not actually send Elijah literally yet. Freak out, freak out, freak out. All right, there's a prophecy. There's, uh, uh, there's several prophecies that Elijah must first come. All right, so here we have Jesus. He's born, he's preaching, 
all is in place. Well, where's Elijah? And Jesus said, John has the spirit of Elijah, but he is not Elijah. He is fulfilling the role of Elijah before Elijah actually comes. Da, 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 da. This is the first coming. But there is coming, there is going to be a time when Elijah does come, actually, physically, does come. When is that? When do you think Elijah comes? When Jesus comes. Has to be before Jesus comes. Moses and Elijah will be. Moses and Elijah come in the tribulation. Yeah, yeah tribulation. They'll come down. Okay. The and then Jesus. So that's his first coming. Jesus comes again. So we know that this has to take place for this to take place. But then before this second coming, Jesus has already come. So John is in place of Elijah. So that's just a little bit of mind-blowing. Uh, number D, God knowing that Israel will reject Jesus, he didn't bring Elijah then, or else he'd have to bring Elijah twice. Okay, so that's, I guess, the answer there. Number, number E, remember that Elijah will have his head cut off, just like John the Baptist's head was cut off one day. And John, now let's... Um, F, John's baptism. Some very important things about John's baptism. Number one, it was prophetic. Prophetic. John's baptism, Jesus said, suffer it to be so that all the scriptures will be fulfilled. So Jesus was fulfilling scripture when he was baptized and when all of Israel was being baptized. So it was prophetic. Number two, it was preparatory. 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 P R E P A R A T O R Y. Preparatory. Now, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance to prepare people to accept the Messiah. Did anyone get saved when John preached and when John baptized? Did anyone get saved? They were already saved. No. When he had people coming, they were coming, but there was no Messiah yet. They didn't even know what to look for until John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So they had not had their sins taken away yet. This was a baptism that was a, 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 uh, an agreement with God that said, I'm burying my old faith. I am dumping it. I am ready for the new, the new wine. I'm ready for the Messiah. So that baptism was a humiliation of the Jews, it was supposed to be, a humiliation of the Jews and of their faith that had ended. And they were saying, we're ready for the Messiah, because they knew the old covenant was going to be replaced with the new covenant. And they're ready for it. So that baptism was only for Israel, and it was only to get them ready for the Messiah. It never saved anybody. It, it brought them to a place of repentance. But did you know... You can't be saved by just repenting. No, but you believe... You have, to re you have to realize, I am a sinner, and then accept the Messiah. The Mess as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. By repentance, every Catholic I know, every older Catholic, has repented 500 times in their life. Every drunkard I've ever met has always repented 100 times in their life. And I wish I could put this down. I'm so sorry I picked up that first drink. But they've never believed on Jesus. They never put the two together. And so these Jews were baptized for them to say, my old beliefs are behind me. I'm ready for the Messiah. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if I agree with that. That's okay. That's all right. You're going you're gonna to have a trouble where the people who were baptized by John, not one of them got saved. Every one of them needed now to start to follow Jesus because following Jesus and believing on Him, after they got baptized, they, when they followed Him, that's when they believed on him. Well, it's like it's like the Pharisees came and they were looking into the river and saying, "What are you out there?" Like, and and John was saying, "Bring, bring us works, fruits. Work, fruits, meat for repentance." Yes. Because the Pharisees hadn't a clue what was going on, hmm. even though they were supposed to be the religious leaders. They're supposed to be. But the faithful came to John the Baptist, as I, in the ones who were believed in God. Like, if believed we, in God, but not in the Messiah. No, they, they didn't know who Jesus was. I'm, exactly. I'm not saying they did. Exactly. But they were still saved because they believed in God. Okay. They under the Old Testament. Uh, under the Old Testament covenant, and under the Old Testament... Um, Salvation was uh, always by faith through grace. Obviously. 
But uh, what I want to show is you have to notice that you have the cross here. And before the cross, every single time, um, uh, there, was, there was the lambs where each one of them were payment for their sins. But not one of them could fully pay off the sin. Hebrews says, not one of them actually removed sins. It took the cross to actually take off. So these were what we call I-O-U's. I owe, uh, that lamb is going to be, that is, that is just a put off, it is a put back for a year, my sins, until, keep putting off, put off, put off, until the one final lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. So when they trusted and they put their, when they put their sins on that lamb and that lamb was slaughtered and the blood was shed, they could go away atoned, they could go away pardoned, forgiven, because there was coming one final lamb that would take all of that blood and well, take all of the sin that had built up and put it on himself, on his account. And that was their salvation, by faith, in, in the lambs. It's called the substitutionary death for the sinner. But what I'm getting at is, you've got John coming along, and so you've got all of these times where people are believing lambs. But John comes along and says, repent. They were all, John the every one of them, John the Baptist, Every one of the people uh, had already trusted the Lamb. But now they're being called to repent. What are they repenting of? They were coming to what's called the end of what we call the end of the age, or the, the end of the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant was, 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 was start to finish in the Old Testament, um, uh, through the priesthood, it was through the sacrifices, it was through um, um, uh, uh, everything that, that had been established from Abraham and through Levi and um, all of that. At the end of the Old Covenant, Jesus um, comes along and he says, he says repent. But they, they still needed, they needed, I'm going to draw here, they needed a belief. They needed a Messiah to believe in. And they had repented, but they had no one to believe in. So John the Baptist is changing everything. He's like a, um, I don't know, uh, a, a, a new captain of the ship coming along and changed the whole direction of Israel saying, we're going to focus on the Messiah. And as soon as when Jesus came, John had prepared everyone so they all believed. And they flocked to him. Not when they, they didn't all get saved, but they all wanted to follow him. So his preaching prepared them to believe. That was the whole point of it. So his baptism was only a baptism of repentance that was not for them to... They had, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, right? Mm -hmm. And they could not believe. They had already believed on the lambs, yes. But now they're being called in this, what we call a transition time. There is a transition time where you're just going to be believing on Jesus. Well, I would have said they would have always trusted in the Lord rather than in lambs, per se. Uh, okay, and I, and I don't, there's no fault with that, but if you look at the particulars, what is the focus of, of John coming and preaching and preaching repentance if they already believed? Yeah, but he said, but John preached. John John barely preached the baptism of repentance, saying that they should they should they should turn and believe on the one who's coming after me. Right, but they had no idea who he was. Well, no, that's, what his, that's what his job was. Yeah, exactly. Was. So they repented and they would believe. Yeah. But after they believed, then in Acts chapter two, it says those that had been baptized. It says, and as many as received. I'm sorry, Acts chapter two. It says. Um, uh, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. Mm -hmm. And that baptism is a, ba Acts chapter 2 was a baptism, um, uh, uh, there's a, a baptism of repentance, they believe, and now there's the, what we call believer's baptism. And believer's baptism is you saying to the world, I'm now following Jesus Christ. Here, they're not knowing who, they're ready to follow, now they are following. So there's a whole other baptism which confuses everybody. But it was prophetic because he's preparing them. Like you said, I want you to believe on him who's coming, of whose I'm not worthy to unloose his shoe. Number two, it's preparatory 
to get you to accept the Messiah, and it is particular, number three, his baptism was to the Jews only. He only went to the Jews. Number three, John was the greatest man to ever live. Think about that. Jesus had more, had, Jesus had to be more than just a man to not be less than John the Baptist. He was the God man, so he's obviously greater than John. But, uh, those in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John born in the kingdom of this world. So in the future, and I, um, uh, he says, those who get into the kingdom of heaven <laughs> are greater than John. What a thing to say. And just, I want to try to say it as briefly as possible. Um, uh, those who are born again are greater and, than the best of all the Old Testament could produce. Just by, I got, I got, I'm a Gentile, and now I'm related to Abraham. I mean, I'm a direct descendant by faith of the best of the best. So those in the kingdom of heaven are greater than John, and John was the greatest of people in the world. Number four. There's a battle for the coming kingdom of heaven, and uh, the coming kingdom of heaven is called the millennium. Did you notice there he says, um, verse 12, he says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. So there's coming a battle um, for, the, for the kingdom of heaven. Satan wants to rule via the Antichrist, and he, through religion, will try and take it by force. But the battle of Armageddon will defeat him. All the Old Testament prophets pointed to John and Elijah coming before the Messiah appears, and then the kingdom of heaven would be established. So we already established John was Elijah, just not literally, in the flesh yet, but he had the spirit of Elijah. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. What is the answer for this one, Pastor? That one's millennium. The battle coming. Millennium, is it? Millennium. The kingdom of heaven is the millennium. You go to 2 Kings chapter 2, and verse 9. We're going back to a time when Elisha is hearing that Elijah was leaving. And notice what Elisha asks for. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. Why, why don't you read that? <clears throat> now therefore... Oh, sorry, no, 2-9. 2 9, two nine. Two, Second Kings 2-9. Two oh, <laughs> And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And what did Elijah say? See, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing to ask. I don't know how to do that, but if you see me go up, I guess it'll happen. And so, however many miracles that Elijah did, Elisha, I think he's like 17, Elisha did exactly twice. Mm -hmm. But John the Baptist comes along, he doesn't just have a double portion of the spirit, he has the very spirit of Elijah. Yeah, and, and you explain that, I don't know. You see, we, we, we understand body, soul, spirit. Uh, and so that's, that's Elijah. We have uh, Elisha. Elijah didn't give him his soul. He, uh, he, God gave him a portion of his spirit, or whatever spirit was on him was now on him. And whatever spirit was on Elijah was in uh, John, in its fullness. And he, he, he was fulfilling the role of Elijah. So, um, just quickly, let me get down to see and we're done. This, the generation of Jesus' day is like children, only playing with life and God and eternity, only making money, only manipulating each other through music and enchantments. Jesus says, you guys are like children. But they could not manipulate John nor Jesus. John was a Nazarite. He never ate much nor drank hardly anything at all except water. And yet he was called demon-possessed. <laughs> He says, you're not Beelzebub, just because he didn't eat like everybody else. Number B. And yet here's Jesus. He ate with sinners. He was a friend of sinners. He came eating with people um, and drinking, not alcohol, and yet he was slammed as a gluttonous drunkard. What were they trying to do? Manipulate him, trying to accuse him so that he would change, and they didn't affect him. 
So number nine, he finishes with, but wisdom is justified of her children. What does that mean? It simply means that the wisest truths are not proven until the fruit is grown. Your children prove whether you were teaching right or not until it is seen in the next generation. All right, we'll stop there for tonight. Um, the wisdom justified by her children. So it's a phrase that Jesus used. Wisdom is justified by your children, which means, you know, somebody looks and says, uh, for example, uh, some people um, uh, put God first, and they're in church on Sunday, and they, they put the Bible first, and people go, that's a waste of your time. I say, no, I, I, my life will prove that this was right. My children will prove that this is the right way to live, and my children's children will be a proof of it. So you don't have to have all the blessings now. You don't have to have God shining around you all the time for you to, to be right. You just want to make sure that your kids um, uh, are, get the truth and they will be the proof that what you believed and what you did was right. Alright, we will stop there.